Hey everybody, this is Kevin Bass from the dietwars.com here to talk to you about a recent thread on Twitter by a guy named Anthony Gustin. He's a good friend of uh, diet guru, carnivore diet guru, Paul Saladino, as well as Brian Sanders and many others. And what this group of people do is they go to Tanzania to go on tourist trips with the Hadza. They pay somebody to go around and hunt with the Hadza, spend time with Hadza men hunting. And um, they then go share with the world what the Hadza really do in order to provide some sort of wisdom or insight into what human beings should be eating because the Hadza apparently eat that way. And this thread that he recently created, uh, it has about 2,000 retweets. It's um, quite viral on Twitter right now. It's probably going to get substantially more than that. Uh, and uh, it drastically and dramatically misrepresents what the Hadza actually eat. And I'm going to go explain that now. Uh, now, before I do that, it's really important to explain that hunter-gatherer, there are many hunter-gatherer tribes that eat quite a lot of animal products. And in fact, hunter-gatherer tribes in general eat more meat than you would see in the standard American diet by, in some cases, quite a large margin. A very substantial proportion of hunter-gatherer calories are from meat in many hunter-gatherer groups, some of them almost exclusively meat. And there's no question about this whatsoever. In fact, you can even say that hunter-gatherers on the spectrum of meat-eating versus plant-eating tend to actually lean towards more meat eating, a meat predominant diet rather than a plant predominant diet. There are some hunter gatherer groups that do eat a predominance of plants to an extreme degree, say more than 90% of their calories come from plants. But these hunter gatherer groups are much less common than the groups that eat, say more than 90% from meat. And the same goes for 80% in each end. So there is a skew towards meat eating in the hunter gatherer literature on observations of hunter-gatherers. So I'm not coming here to present to you a picture of the Hadza that is somehow biased towards plant-eating. No, it's, I'm openly saying that uh, the, the vast majority of the literature very de clearly demonstrates that a lot of hunter-gatherer groups get a lot of their calories from meat. There's no question about this, at least contemporary hunter-gatherers, as far as we know. There's no question about this. It's not a controversy, it's not a dispute. So I'm not using this example of the Hadza in order to um, or in order to promote a, a theory or a view of hunter-gatherers that they're mostly plant eaters because they're not. I'm just correcting this gross misuse of the Hadza as kind of the mascots of the carnivore diet. It's an uh, un unethical thing to be doing, to be spending time with these groups that are threatened in their life ways and, and their their livelihoods in some cases being displaced, using them as mascots for your diets on Twitter and on Instagram. It's a very unethical and um, it's an un untruthful way of going about things. And I'm going to explain to you why. So Anthony says, he starts out his thread saying, I hunted, killed and ate a wild baboon, brains and all with the indigenous Hadza tribe in Africa. And before I even go on, continue on this thread, it's really important to note that the reason they're eating baboons is not because they normally eat baboons. They don't normally eat baboons. They're eating baboons because many of their food resources are displaced and they're resorting to eating baboons. Like that's something to, important to, to point out. And the, the lights go out. Okay. The next, sorry, the lights went out in the room uh, that I'm in and I had to wave my hands because they turn off automatically. Uh, if, if there's no movement in the room, okay. But anyway, we're gonna continue on with the thread. It says, here are the 13 things I learned about human health along the way, thread. And here's a picture of Anthony with these hunter-gatherers. Um, in some ways, Anthony's staring off into the distance. Uh, it's actually a kind of a funny picture. Anthony's like staring off into the distance in kind of this existential meditative state while the other people are just looking around. Uh, it's quite funny. He, he his his um, sensorium and his his emotional state is actually quite uh, um, disconnected in some ways from the hunter gatherers that are around him. Uh, that's an interesting thing I just observed. Anyway, so the thread goes on and says, but why? I've been fascinated with human health my entire life. Wild humans with their full genetic expression are nearly extinct. By the way, I don't know what that means with their full genetic expression. What is, okay, but anyway, we are now zoo inhabitants, all right? 
So last year, Carnivore MD and I went to Tanzania, where humans first evolved, to see our species and our natural habitat. It's really important to note that humans didn't first evolve in Tanzania. Um, they, they evolved all throughout the world. Um, but of course, the first humans came from Africa, but not necessarily from Tanzania. They came from Africa, the first migrations, and there were several waves of migrations of humans out of Africa, uh, different um, human lineages that came out of Africa to then colonize the rest of the world. But the uh, humans didn't come from Tanzania specifically. Uh, they they don't. And, and it says he, he went to see where humans first of all to see our species in its natural habitat. Well, this actually isn't the natural habitat of of um of where we evolved the africa of today is quite different from the africa of our evolution so that's another thing that's important to point out but this is a little bit academic let's get onto the meat as it were of the uh dispute he says the first thing that he learned is that meats greater than plants so i guess meats are better than plants something i don't know exactly but meats greater sign plants okay the hot surprised hunted meat over all plants. In fact, they barely eat any plants. They chew on roots and spit them out and boil them for soup and eat small amounts, berries and baobab. I think he's meant to say eat small amounts of berries and baobab, small amounts of berries and baobab. The men dream about big game hunts, not huge salads or leafy greens. And uh, the, the, uh, he has a picture of a bunch of men around a fire with like a dead dog like thing, a skinny dog type animal that they killed. Maybe like a weasel. I'm not sure, but it's uh, they seem quite happy and it's a men around to hunt. And he goes on to say, too, uh, uh, hunting used to be bountiful, but now it's not. Protected safari areas less than 100 miles away from the hot, where the hides live look like the Lion King in their natural state. Thousands of large game as far as the eye can see, could see, it says, it says could see, I, he said can see, he says could see. Okay, whatever. This used to be normal for them. Now it's impossible. What used to be normal for them? Okay, but now what's impossible? Okay. All right, all right, we'll go on to the, to the next tweet. They used to walk under one kilometer and easily kill a large, huge antelope to feed the entire tribe. Now they walk 30 kilometers to kill one baboon. Why? Increasing industrialization with highways, onion farming, core mon monocrops, and pastoralist tribes have pushed large game away from their lands. I thought he just said protected safari areas less than 100 miles away look like the Lion King in their natural state. But now there's no large game. Okay, all right. Well, let's just continue. The same goes for most of the world. What same goes for most of the world? They, there were hundreds of millions of bison, antelope, and elk roaming our lands in the USA until, in our lands in the U, our lands in the USA until Westernized humans came and hunted them to extinction, and then industrialized us into our current man-made zoo. Uh, okay. He goes on to say a bunch of other things, jogging, about jogging, and uh, there's no sprinting or there's only sprinting and walking. There's no jogging. Um, water, stuff about water. Well, it's actually important. Let's go talk about the jogging. Uh, there's no jogging, sprinting, or there's only sprinting or walking. Even though you see a chubby, chubby modern humans beating their joints up, jogging on pavements for hours on in for quote unquote cardio, we didn't see anything remotely similar to the hot. So they walk a lot. They sprint intensely around under and over trees. Well, it's important to note that the hods aren't like other hunter gatherer tribes. There are tribes that actually do jog. Um, they jog walk. They do. There's called a, what is it? Persistence hunting. And uh, those are still observed, I think, in New Guinea. Um, it's believed that our adaptations to be able to run quite well for long distances, uh, in other words, jogging, because we can do it better than any other animal, except I think the, there's a particular, uh, there's a particular mammal that uh, apparently can 
can sprint really fast. It can go over really long distances. But he, humans are among the best adapted for long distance running. And the reason it's believed is because of the persistence hunting. But as human beings gain more technology over time, we didn't need to do persistence hunting anymore. Persistence, persistence hunting, by the way, just consists of chasing around an animal, walking, running, uh, jogging, uh, so that the animal has to run away. And then you just keep going until the animal basically falls over and uh, passes out from heat exhaustion uh, because animals aren't many, most animals aren't really well adapted to running and walking over long distances. So a way of human hunting used to be, you just chase the animal, use jogging or running type thing. And since we were very, we are extremely well adapted to such activities, we could just wear them out and then we club them. And so there are still hunter gatherer groups that do this. And it's believed that that used to be, that is the primitive, that is the most primordial primitive way of hunting. Uh, even, and it's still practiced by some groups today, but it's been replaced by more technologies that hunter gatherers now have. In any case, he talks about water. He talks about honey. Um, he talks about work, you know, work stressed. Uh, Hods and men work three to four hours a day. There's no stress. Among Hadzo men, uh, we have no practical skills because we can't start fires. Um, okay. Do, do, do. Uh, fa fasting. They do fasting. Um, organs are prized. They eat organs. Uh, they eat slow and in commun communion. C communion. There's no waste. They don't eat berries, apparently. So they don't eat berries, or at least a lot of them. We stopped to snack on a random berry bush and I had a few handfuls. I got so sick, I was hallucinating for hours. Turns out the seeds need to be spit out or you can die if you eat enough of them. Whoops. High fiber diets are a myth. The hops are celebrated for their diverse microbiome. Studies claim that this connected their hundreds of grams of fiber consumption per day. This is a lie. Scant, root, scant roots they harvest are chewed up and spit out. They barely eat fiber. Um, okay, cool. So, and then he's like, he has like a podcast where he says, if you want to learn, learn more about this hunting trip and our wild stay with the Hadza tribe, listen to their podcast, Carnivore, that Carnivore MD and I did about it here. Want to learn more? Uh, you know, follow along and sign up for my weekly newsletter. Oh yeah, there's your weekly newsletter link at the end. And then he says, um, "What else do you want to hear about my trip to see the Hadza? Happy to write more threads. Just reply to this and let me know." So I actually wrote a, a response to this because I found this thread ridiculous. It's like, and not only is it ridiculous, it disturbs me because I've I've seen these claims before. Uh, Paul Saladino, Carnivore MD, makes them all the time. And uh, I just wanted to point out how many of the things that he said were f just frankly wrong. Just apart from apart from being, in some cases, simple-minded and in some cases not representing the anthropological literature very well, like some of the things he said are actually just false. So I wrote in response, I said, I'm confused and disturbed about this thread. Uh, while you claim to have spent time with the Hadza, you appear to be misrepresenting their diets. And I wrote, said, a thread. Okay, here's my thread. So I said, all published literature, and this is true, this is absolutely true. I looked in this, into this for hours and hours and hours. I've gone way down the rabbit hole here. I've gone um, to the published literature, many, many different papers that show the same thing. Uh, all published literature clearly shows the predominance of plant foods over animal foods among the hot sides. Just not the case. Unlike the carnivore people want to believe, they want to believe that uh, um, that the Hadza ate more meat than plants because they like to use the Hadza as a mascot. But this is actually not true. They actually eat more plants than animal foods. There is one region. And, and so I, what I do here is I show the, um, the oh, and I need to go move the window here. Let's see if I can get the window moved here. Beautiful, beautiful. So I got the window moved here. Um, as you can see in this window, if you study it and if you want to, if you're watching the video for this, just pause it. As you can see, uh, the predominance of their of their um, food 
in total kilograms is going to be berries, tubers, baobab, and honey. And meat really only provides a small fraction of this. Um, in some months, there's one month in particular that's, I think, August or that's August. In August, they have more kilograms from meat than from other sources. But overwhelmingly, the food weight, the food volume is coming from foods other than meat. Overwhelmingly. It's overwhelming. And it's important to note, this isn't fatty meat. This is lean meat. So if you compare the calories in lean meat per gram to other foods that they're getting, especially baobab, um, the calories per gram are actually greater in some of these other foods than they are in the meat that they're getting. So it's not like this is very cal calorific meat. It's not in most cases. It's quite lean and not calorific. So measuring by grams doesn't dramatically misrepresent the amount of calories, the percentage of calories that they're getting in, the percentage of calories that they're getting from meat, or at least the percentage of weight that they're getting from meat is on the order of 20 to 40 percent. And in some cases, 5 percent. So 5 to 40 percent, 5, 10, yeah, 5, 10, 20 percent in some cases from meat. Cool. That's it. Some months, it's, it's like lower than 5 percent. So in February, it's like lower than 5 percent in this particular study that they did. Okay. So there is, however, one region called the uh, Dundoya, where the predominance of food that they have is actually from meat in terms of the kilograms. It's something like, it's a lot here. It's something like uh, 70%. That's a lot. It's a lot. But the other regions, all the other regions that the Hadza eat uh, is... Uh, if they had to eat, that the Hadza live in, all the other regions, they're getting only about 20%, 10 to 20%, 30% most of their kilograms from meat. In some cases, yes. In fact, 10 to 20%. So not a lot. Not a lot. And certainly not more meat than plants. It's certainly the case that in some regions and in some periods, the vast majority of their calories are coming from Berries. So, for example, in November, in this group studied, about 80% of their calories are coming from berries. 80%, sorry, 80% of the food volume is from berries. 80%. So, this is unreal. It's a lot. And it's not the case whatsoever, not the case whatsoever, that they're getting most of their food from meat. It's not. It's just not true. Okay. And this paper is called Tubers as Fallback Foods and their impact on Hadza hunter-gatherers. That's what this paper is called, okay? So you can look it up, you can read it, and the link is gonna be right here on my thread. If you wanna go find my thread, that's at Kevin and Bass, K-E-V-I-N, in Bass on Twitter. You can find this thread where I debunk this stuff. And I said to him, I said, are those the Hadza that you spend your time with, Dr. Anthony Gustin? If so, you should clarify that the Hadza you spent your time with are an outlier. That is to say, are the Hadza from the Dundoya region the ones he spent his time with? They are an outlier. They're not the typical Hadza. Okay. Other papers, including those written by paleo pioneers Lauren Corden and Boyd Eaton, also endorse the view of the Hadza of the Hadza as predominantly plant eaters. Here they cite a reference showing that the Hadza consume eighty percent of their diet as plants. And I'll. Just, just um, read the quote. Secondly, in contrast to common belief, hunting probably played a less dominant role from a nutritional point of view compared to gathering. And on average, it makes up 35% of the subsistence base for present day worldwide hunter gatherers, independent of latitude or environment. For example, hunting by some surviving hunter gatherers is still not very successful. The probability of for a kill among Kung Bushman is only 23%. Did you like how I did that? Kung Bushman. I was, I was literally like, that is the reason I decided to make this video just so that I could do that. But the problem, the probability of the kill in Kung Bushman, I did it again. And Kung Bushman is only 23%. And the subsistence of the Hadzabe, which is the Hadza, as described by Woodburn, consists of 80% plant foods. Bam. Okay, so that's Lauren Cordain and Boyd Eaton, the pioneers of the paleo diet. They are the paleo diet pioneers. They are saying that the Hadza eat 
80% of plant foods. And the, by the way, this citation from Woodburn, I think is from the 60s. So this is like 70 years ago, 60 to 70 years ago. Okay, right. 60 to 70 years ago, this work was being done. It was the case then, it's the case now. So, and, 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 and all right, still other papers, including this one by professional anthropologist Herman Ponser. Herman Ponser is a professor of anthropology at Duke. Um, he also characterizes the Hadza diet. While they did find a high intake of meat among both Hadza groups studied, the intake of plant calories was higher than, the, than from those of meat. So look, in both the Singeli and the Sitako, the meat calories were between 30 and 40 percent. And in each case, plant foods provided more of the total calories than calories from meat. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It's just the way that it works out. It's not what Gustin's saying. And I said, interesting as interestingly, as Dr. Ponser points out, Hod's carbohydrate intake was higher than the average American diet, while the fat intake was lower. This is so interesting because um, the Hods are like on, they're kind of like on a low fat diet, friends. They're on like a low fat diet. This is not like a carnivore keto diet. This is a freaking low fat diet. Okay. And it's not more like, they, it's not like, okay, let's go back to what Anthony Gustin said. Let's go back to what he said. He said, he wrote, he wrote, this is hilarious because it's just so un incorrect. It's like so wrong. And we'll explain why it's wrong in a moment. Like, how did he get this so wrong? He says, they, he says, the Hadza prize hunted meat over all plants. In fact, they barely eat any plants. They barely eat any plants. They chew on roots and spit them out. Boil them soup for soup and eat small amounts of berries and balabat. I just showed in this paper that that's not true. In two different papers, it's not true. In some cases, in some seasons, berries are like 80% of the calories, my friend. Or at least 80% of the food volume. Okay? And certainly a, a disproportionate amount of the calories, the majority of the calories. All right? So it's so weird that he says this because it's just so inaccurate. It's just completely false. But let's let's continue going on. He says... I said, what, what's more, this is what I wrote, I said, what's more, the preference for meat is seen mainly in Hadza men, not in women. Hadza women actually prefer baobab and berries over meat. This is also consistent with the food patterns among the Maasai and many other traditional human groups. And by the way, it's not just among traditional human groups, it's among modern human groups as well. The same patterns hold among modern humans in 2022 in Americans and Europeans and humans all around the world, the men tend to prefer meat. They eat more meat and they prefer it than the women do. The women rank meat as something that they prefer at a lower level than men do. It's kind of a human universal as far as I can tell. Okay. And I show here, the women actually prefer baobab and berries above meat. So it's not this preference that, but, you know, it's not. It's just, it's not that the preference that the Hadza prefer only meat. Hadza men do. Hadza men prefer honey the most, then meat, then everything else. So meat over everything except for honey. But among women, meat is, is like, is like the fourth preferred food only above tubers. Meat is not highly sought after women. So I said this to him. I said, did you spend most of your time with the men of the Hadza, Dr. Anthony Gustin? From the pictures you included, it appears so. So if you look at the pictures he included in his thread, there's like 40 men, and there's like one picture of one woman. He he spent his most of his time with men. That's part of the reason probably he thinks that they overwhelmingly prefer meat, because he only talked to the men. And we'll, we'll understand why that is in a moment, because it's kind of funny. It's just like, it's not funny, it's terrible, but it's... It is what it is, right? I said, if so, you should clarify that female and male food preferences among the Hadza differ and that females do not prefer meat over plants. They don't. They simply don't. It seems that your account contradicts 100 years of literature on the Hadza. You also accused scientists of lying about the Hadza diets. This is disturbing. And why is this so disturbing? It's disturbing because, first of all, he's accusing scientists of lying. Why would they lie? Like, we already know. Scientists have repeatedly shown, and it's like widely accepted among anthropologists that hunter-gatherer groups eat way more meat than modern humans do. There's no question. They're not. We're not. Scientists are not trying to veganize hunter-gatherer groups. They're not. We don't care about that. 
I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm speaking as a scientist. I don't care about veganizing. I don't care about that. I believe in dietary protein. I argue on behalf of the dietary protein all the time. I do not care. What I care about is the facts. <laughs> so hunter-gatherers consume a lot of animal products. There is no question. But as far as the Hadza are concerned, it is absolutely not true that the Hadza don't eat plants. They eat a predominance of plants. This is the fact about the Hadza. And it offends me that, that this person on the internet is, is misrepresenting the facts to make the Hadza the mascot of the diet that he's promoting. So he, that you sign up for his newsletter, blah, 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 his mailing list and make him money. He's using this group as a mascot for his diet. I find that really offensive. And so I say, if, if the scientists are lying, then that is the end of it. But the literature is replete with hunter gatherers who eat large quantities of meat. It's clear according to anthropologists that many hunter gatherers consumed more meat than Americans. So why would the scientists lie about the Hadza? They're not lying. We're just saying how it is. We just want to tell you how it is. This is how the Hadza live. But they're not lying, so don't just stop. So I said, overall, I'm disturbed by the misrepresentation of a people with whom you spent time. You spent time with these human beings. Although, according to the pictures, it looks like he was kind of in another place when he was spending his time with them. He wasn't really spending time with them. He was doing his own thing. But that's fine. I'm disturbed by the misrepresentation of a people with whom you spent time to make them out to eat something of a carnivore diet, a carnivore diet that he promotes, that he promotes before he ever learned about the Hadza. Okay. So I said, if you were a professional anthropologist, this would be considered a grave professional ethical violation. It would. It's like he's using these people as a mascot. Okay. So I found the explanation for Dr. Anthony Gustin's observations here. Uh, and then I, uh, Herman actually responded to to uh, to Anthony before I even made this threat. He said, well, let's just go read this stuff. Okay. Uh, Rich Collins says, what do you think your observate? Why do you think your observations are so different from those of Her Herman Ponser and other anthropologists? I think Rich is a maybe have seen some of my threats and, and maybe maybe it was Herman's. But like I've written about this a lot. Um, and then this guy named J Jacob Gunther says, likely different seasons and subgroups. There's a legitimate argument there is potentially. And then Herman says, nope, he went on a safari, safari to a tourist camp and told them he wanted to go hunting. They took him hunting. This is like learning marine biology by going on a cruise or learning world affairs by visiting the Epcot Center. It differs from actual research because it's not actual research. And then um, Anthony responds, oh, yes, apologies for the lack of disclaimer tweet that I am, in fact, not an anthropologist and this is not peer reviewed research. I'm curious what you think is inaccurate about my experience. And then other people respond to him. They say, the fact that you only spent with them a couple of days, and you think you can refute actual research that lasted for orders of magnitude longer periods than with that. And then Rich says, not questioning your experience, just questioning whether your conclusions can be generalized to their long-term lifestyle. Ba -ba -ba -bam. And then so what I said, how I concluded the thread, is I said, I learned a few things about methods from a bachelor's degree in anthropology. As I remember, it is easy to project your values onto groups you are studying. The Number one, that's number one. It is easy to project your values onto the groups you are studying. Does it ring a bell here? Number two, the groups you are studying will often show you what you want to see. And there's some classic examples of this and critiques of, say, Margaret Mead. And we don't want to have to get into that. But, um, yeah, there's classic examples of anthropology of both of these points, of famous anthropological works falling foul of these basic principles. And I, so I said great care must be taken because – it seems that this particular person fell foul of those principles one more time. And by the way, as an anthropology major who wrote a, a, a special honors thesis in anthropology, uh, my honors thesis is crap. It's total garbage. And why? Because I did the same thing. Because it's very easy to project your values onto the groups you're studying. 
and to see what you want to see in those situations. And uh, I did the same thing for my honors thesis. I look back at it now, it's very cringe because I made those same mistakes. So these are mistakes people make. These are the, the cardinal errors of anthropology. These are the errors that anthropology is obsessed about not making. There's books and books and books and books and books. There's whole library racks filled with books about wh- how not to make this mistake. Literally, um, at least, you know, these days we're phasing out libraries. But back when we had libraries 10 years ago, there were literally entire library racks, racks at, at major universities filled row after row with books about anthropological met- ethnographic methodology where it just basically said, don't make these mistakes. And how are we not going to make these mistakes? Because it actually gets more complicated. But there are ways, and one of the ways is using objective scientific uh, appraisals and means of appraising the evidence. And that's what many of these scientists have done. This is what this guy didn't do. So if you ever hear anything from Paul Saladino, from freaking, you know, Brian Sanders, from this Anthony Gustin dude telling you that, you know, these hunter-gatherers, they lived in nature and they only ate meat, blah, blah, blah. This isn't true. They, this is not true that they only ate meat. It's a really important thing. Don't let these guys make the Hadza into a mascot. It's just not, it's just fiction. And I just wanted to share that because it bothers me so much that I see them taking advantage of these people to make them into the mascot for, for, for um, the carnivore diet. Because it's a lie. This is a bold lie and uh, it makes me sad. So that's my thread on this. That's my video. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you liked it, if you enjoyed it, if you hated it, um, send a comment that helps my video do better and uh, press like, share this, please subscribe, 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 please subscribe. And um yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Check out, I've now got my podcast going. We've got the, this YouTube channel. Check all that stuff out. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok at Kevin in Bass. Uh, that's K E V I N. And then there's another N, two N's, K E V I N N Bass, B A S S. And I'm on these different platforms. And so if you enjoyed this video, share it. Let people know that this is nonsense and uh, follow me, subscribe, hear more of my stuff because I am one of the best in this area. Meaning, you know, online diet information and misinformation. I am one of the best, if not the best. All right. Thanks for watching.